and the rain is the best movie musical ever made. I agree. Yeah. How you really felt about it? If you, if, if I like it. <laughs> <laughs> nice man you are. Is there anything about the movie and looking at it uh, as an artist that you would change about it that you wish you hadn't done? Because we think it's a very funny question. Because I was living in Europe many years after the film was made, and I was a friend of, of another director named Jules Dassin. Oh. Oh. And he lived, I lived in London, and he lived in Paris. And he called me one day, because we were good friends, and he said, I have an idea for a movie uh, for Melina McCurry, his lady. And he said, this is my idea. It's going to be a movie about silent movies to talkies, and she's going to be someone with an odd voice. And I said, Julie, I made that movie. And he said, what? I made it. I mean, as a matter of fact, you stay in Paris. I'm going to bring you a prisoner and we'll run it together. And when I started, this was 20 years or so after we had made the movie, and I took the movie and recut it really? to show it to him. Now, but time goes by and makes you change your mind about things. The movie doesn't change. We all change with the times. And so I, I made the big musical sequence shorter. I don't remember what else I did. But I was, uh, I, 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 so if, if I was fiddling with it, I was fiddling with it, and I think if I had looked at it for today, I probably would fiddle with it again. <laughs> no. It's, it's our nature to think, oh wait, I can do that better again. Now the casting, I, I've always heard, and is it true that Oscar Levant was the first choice really to play Cosmo? And <laughs> boom. Oh my God. Oh, like, <laughs> MGM, I mean, I... Well, who's MGM? That's a big place. No, <laughs> Oscar Levant was the first choice of Arthur Freed. Arthur Freed, okay. Mm -hmm. They were good friends. He, would, he had, had him in, in American in Paris immediately before seeing in the rain. And when Arthur Freed told me and Gene, I'd like that to be Oscar Levant. We said, are you out of your mind? <laughs> he can't walk. <laughs> no! So it, was a, it was a big struggle because we had an, an idea of how we wanted to do this movie and it didn't include Oscar Levant. This grumpy, funny, uh, albeit very funny, but not the character right. of, of this character we call Cosmo McMoon who we stole the name from the man who played uh, piano for Florence Foster Jenkins. <laughs> His name is Cosmo. Uh -huh. And so uh, it, it, that's how, and finally Arthur gave in. It was a humiliation to him because Oscar, Oscar Levant was his good friend. And Could you also tell us uh, your side of the story about Debbie Reynolds? She always has said that you, she, you and Jean didn't want her for the part. And well, then. I don't think that's, I, I, my memory is another thing that's odd. <laughs> I need to be telling you exactly how I remember it, and I don't remember it like that. Because the author, who loved Judy Garland, as we all did, really wanted Judy Garland. And as much as I thought she was absolutely the best thing ever in movies, if you put her in a part where she's supposed to be an, a, an innocent, you know, not experienced person, and when she turns into a movie star, it's not much of a surprise. <laughs> so, uh, I didn't want Judy Garland. I wanted her in every other movie in the world, uh -huh. but not in this part. Is there anybody else that you, besides Debbie that you've considered or that you would have no. part? Debbie had made this little number called Out of That Right. Three little words. Yes. A monkey to the chimp. <laughs> and she sang that, and she was wonderful, and I thought, well, she'd be great. And she was. Uh -huh. yeah. What about the Jane Hagen role, the Lingle Lamont? Was, was there ever any other? I don't know of any others. Jean Hagen replaced Judy Holliday in, in a, a 
play in New York, and that's where I had seen her. And, and I thought she would be wonderful, and, and I was right. <laughs> now, uh, one of the things that I think to put this uh, movie in its time frame is important because I remember when this movie came out, and it was a movie everybody loved it and went to see it. But it was at that point like, really? Well, in Seattle, Washington, it was. <laughs> Outside. Really? Uh, so, but, but it wasn't a huge hit when we opened. Let's be truthful. Here. Okay. Much as I hate to tell the truth. Well, it's a <laughs> short trip to the Academy Awards. It was nominated there only for music score and Gene Hagen's performance. And the and and New York Times review didn't much like it. They right. said, oh, it's another claptrap Hollywood musical. <laughs> so did that surprise you? Did you did you have any idea of what did you, what you had on your hands when you saw it? No. Uh, no. We always hope that the picture will be received, but you can't predict what the people are going to And as I say, times change. You, you, the people change. The movie, unfortunately, is, is fixed in the film. So it doesn't change. It's it's the surrounding things that make it appear to have changed. So when did you get the indication that people were starting to pick up on it, and when it came, did you rediscover it? It came mostly from Europe. It came from Cahiers du Cinema and some, what was the name of the English magazine, the equivalent of Sight and Sound. And those people, <laughs> they thought it was a wonderful picture. And uh, it slowly got a bigger, bigger reputation. Thank goodness, and that's what happened. But we, it wasn't received with a, a, a America in Paris was a huge right. critical success, not seen. And and as I recall, seeing uh, America in Paris won the Academy Award right around the time Singing in the Rain came out. That's right. And then it kind of overshadowed it with all the blood. Eventually, yes. Yeah, eventually. Yes. Yeah. Does it ever bother you or? Uh, uh, surprise you that with all the great movies that you've made and the work you've done, people so often refer to Singing in the Rain? The people so often that refer to Singing in the Rain when they talk to you. No, I'm, I'm quite happy if they remember anything. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, not, I, mean, I think Two for the Road is just one of the great movies. <laughs> Recently, a movie that nobody has seen was Staircase. Oh, staircase. Yes. yes, and we just had that on. Yes. How did it look? Well, it, it was very interesting. It really was, and and one wonders why it disappeared so quickly. That, that, I don't know if we should talk about uh, Staircase, but what happened? I had seen the play with uh, the, the wonderful performances, and I said to, uh, I think it was. Exactly. Was it Fox? Yes, it was. Fox. And I said, you know, let's make a movie of that. And he said, okay. And it was supposed to be Paul Schofield. So we did the script. I sent it to Paul Schofield. He said, not on your life. <laughs> Never will I play that part in, in a movie. So I said, I called Big Zanuck and said, well, we're out of luck. And he said, well, just while we're on the phone, can you think of anybody else? I said, oh, I can think of a lot of people. He said, for example, who? I said, I don't know, Rex Harrison and Richard Burton. He said, what? <laughs> Can you get them? I said, I don't know. He said, send it to them. It's the only time anything like this ever happened. I sent them the script that night, and the next morning they both called me and said, yes, we're in. <laughs> so it, it, it doesn't always happen like that. Uh, the, the movie star is... I think sort of overshadowed the idea that they were two non-entity people, and that these men were so giant, these two actors, right. that, uh, anyway, we're not here to talk about No, uh, we're here to talk about Singing in the Rain, but I do have to, since we have Sam and Don in here, I do have to ask you just a little, because you also work with the great Fred Astaire, tell them just a little bit. I'll tell you how it happened. I was nine years old. I was born 
in Columbia, South Carolina, and, uh, and I went to the theater to see a movie, which we call Flying Down to Rio. I had never heard of it there. I was nine, and nobody else had it in the, the film world, although he was a star on Broadway. This movie sort of stunned me, and I, I didn't know what I wanted, but I, whatever he did is what I wanted to be near. And so I said, you know, I should study dancing. And my family, who had nothing on earth to do with movies or dancing or musical or anything, said, fine. Yeah, which never surprised me then, but it does now. And so I started studying dancing. And to the wonder of my serendipity, my life has been filled with luck. And often good luck. Not always, but many times good luck. I saw, I saw uh, Flying Down the Rio when I was nine. When I was 25, I directed Fred Astaire in a, a movie. Oh. I mean, nobody said I had that time. <laughs> and he became my good friend for life. And, uh, and he was a, a miracle. Everything, I think, he influenced me more than anyone else in film because he made it look as though it was inevitable, it was easy, it was just the way life was. And that's, I, I didn't realize it at the time, but I, I think is what overrides me in making movies. It just should feel like it happened. It shouldn't feel the presence of people behind it who are guiding it. It should seem like it's a generic experience, like something growing out of the earth. And that's what Chris there had for me. Thank you for telling that. you. I think your acceptance speech, when you won your Special Academy Award, is the best one that was ever given. Song and Dance. Song and Dance. It was uh, when I, I got a phone call from the Academy saying, we voted you a Oscar. Please come and accept it. And I said, okay. And I called my friend Marshall Brickman, who had won an Oscar, I think, for Manhattan or a, another film he wrote with Woody Allen, and I said, can I borrow your Oscar? I want to see what it feels like when they're going to hand me this, this little statue. And uh, he said, sure, and he lent me his Oscar, and I was alone in the room, and I picked up this thing alone, and I started to sing. Heaven, I'm in heaven. <laughs> and that's, that's how it happened. I just reacted to this this object. It was great. Yes, it was great. And before we go, I also want to say that I think this movie. Oh. Yes, we 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 have, to, we have to see the movie, and then another movie is projecting after that. <laughs> but you and I can see the <laughs> But I do think this movie has, besides the great iconic title number that Gene Kelly does. I do think, with maybe the exception of Fred Astaire and Eleanor Powell dancing Begin the Begin and Broadway Melody of 1940, I think this has the greatest dance number of all time with, with Gene Kelly and Donald Connor doing Moses Supposed. That was a big moment because can you imagine that number with Oscar Obama? <laughs> <laughs> Seriously, I know. And uh, Gene and Donald were at their very best. Mm -hmm. And people had never seen Donald O'Connor really dance like he was able to do. And so that was the, the fun of putting that on. Yes, one of the great numbers of all time. Thank and you're going to see it now. Thank you, Stanley. <laughs>